time to share. Thank Jerry for that. I got another idea. That was awesome. Okay. Linda said if it changes up, we she somebody could go get their classes in the time. Would that work better for you? Did you do that? I'm asking She said that somebody could come get her class when it's going to do for me. Okay. Do it last. Is that all right? Um, Okay. That's two ways in one. <laughs> Some of what I was going to talk about today is, is the emotions of Jesus. And um, we've been stirred in our emotion just to be here today. And uh, like I say, I've, I've appreciated Jerry and your ministry to us right now. Um, the Lord came shining through from the east to the west. That touched me. The first time I ever heard, what does it mean as far as the east is from the west? And I didn't understand that. It's like, how could God, through Christ, remove all of our sin, all of our iniquity, and take it upon himself and remove it completely as far as the east is from the west? And they say if you start here and take off to the north, eventually you're going to go past the north cold, you're going to start coming back south again. But if you start here, and you head east, and you head east, you'll never see west. Or if you turn around and go west, and go west, you'll never see east. You're always traveling west. Or you're always traveling east. And never the, never the twain took you. So I appreciate that song. I want to say just a few words about uh, that's right now, I guess. But, <laughs> and that's really a lot about what Easter is about. What did Christ, Yeshua, accomplish for us? And um, my wife Iris gave me a, a Bible here recently. She's been studying it, but um, the complete Jewish study Bible. And it, Jesus was a Jew. He was our high priest, and he was a Jew. And they refer, the, the name for Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua. I want to read a few, just a commentary on, on that. It says, Yeshua is a common alternative for the name Yehoshua, or Joshua, in later books of the Hebrew Bible and among the Jews of the Second Temple period. The name corresponds to the Greek spelling of Lesos, which from the Latin meaning is from the Latin, through Latin is Jesus, uh, or Lesus, L-E-S-U-S. And the English changed it to Jesus. So English speaking, we understand it as Jesus. If you look at the true Jew who Jesus was and what he came to do, Yeshua, for me, seems to fit a little bit better. It helps me to understand Jesus, who he was, better in his name. The first letter in the name Yeshua, Jesus, is Yod, or Y-O-D, and it represents the Y sound in Hebrew. Many names in the Bible that begin with Yod are mispronounced in English speaking because the letter was transliterated in the English Bibles to the letter J rather than Y. And so this is because the early English, the letter J, was pronounced the way we pronounce Y today. So the name was changed a little bit. <coughs> Kind of like my name, Yoder, it originally was called Joder, J-O-D-E-R, but J was silent as a Y, and it was Yoder. But when we came to America, our name was changed from J-O-D-E-R to Y-O-D-E-R. So it's the same thing here. The Hebrew spelling of Yeshua appears in some later books of the Hebrew Bible, once for the Joshua the son of Nun, and 28 times for the Joshua the high priest and other priests called Yeshua, or Yeshua. Although the, the same priests are also given the same... Uh, or the, given the spelling of Joshua in the books of Haggai and Zechariah, Yeshua differs from the usual Hebrew Bible spelling of Joshua, or Yehoshua, found 218 times in the Hebrew Bible. It is also different from the Hebrew spelling Yeshu, which is found in, in uh, Ben Yehuda's dictionary. And you, okay, I'm getting a little bit too wordy here, but let me get to the end of the sentence, end of the summary of what I'm trying to say. 
The name Yeshua is also used in Israeli Hebrew historical texts to refer to other people called Joshua recorded in the Greek text, such as Jesus ben Ananias and Jesus ben Sirah. The name Yeshua means the Lord's salvation. And it also means, or to cry out to the Lord for help. So Yeshua in the Hebrew means, literally, Jesus means to cry out to the Lord for help. And literally, some of the things I'll say later is that's what Jesus accomplished. You know, no longer do we have to sacrifice animals. No longer do we have to continually do all the little nitpicky letters of the law that, that could not even hardly be accomplished by anybody to make them perfect. It's under grace, through faith now. And so, <clears throat> Jesus is, now we can all pray out to the Lord for our help, for our salvation. And he's within every one of us. He's within all of humankind. That spirit of Christ is here within the planet Earth and his creation. And, and all of it will bow to him. So, that is what we all have to look forward to. Let's bring the, the communion now, and if you'd like to, I don't know if you want to put up on the, the overhead uh, some, some reading, but let's look at Luke chapter 22. And in Luke chapter 22, uh, it brings it's my favorite reading of when Christ instituted or when he, he observed the last um, supper if you want to call it that, his last supper before his crucifixion, he became the Passover lamb. So they gathered together to um, have the Passover. And in Luke chapter 22, let's see, let's start about verse 14. And I'm going to read it from the Jewish Bible. When the time came, Yeshua and the emissaries, emissaries meaning the apostles, the Translute called them the apostles now, like before they were called the disciples. But he said to them, I have really wanted so much to celebrate this cigar with you before I die. For I tell you, it is certain that I will not celebrate it again until it is given in its full meaning in the kingdom of God. Jesus also said in the other translations, it says, and it may say it up here, um, and when the hour was come, he sat down, the twelve apostles with him, and he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. A verb becomes a noun. <coughs> with great desire, earnest, if you want to call it passion. He had an emotion. Jesus was very emotional, even though we don't see that or maybe many pulpit preachers don't talk about the emotions of Jesus because they won't want us to think that he was a weakling. But we are all the emotional beings. Amen. Right. And that's how we feel our inner world. That's how we know our inner world. And that's how we feel our outer world. That's how we get along with what we are. And so, as we look, and Paul talked about this, I'm, I'm getting into a little bit of what I want to talk to you, but is that as we look into the mirror of Jesus, as we see our face in the mirror and see Jesus in our face, our glory is changed to his glory. And so we should want to be more and more completely like him in everything that we do. And even in our emotional lives, even in our emotional being. Jesus many times, and he did it again in the Garden of Gethsemane, but many times he was just overwhelmed with the pain, with the, with the hurt of people, whether it was the children or whether it was those who were hungry. Um, he felt their pain. He was with them. And he had to, like, whew, i got to back off. i got to go be with my father. i got to seclude myself to a private place. He did that many times. And he prayed all night. You think, well, how can you pray all night and get up and preach to him the next day? So... I took a break from that last week. I was up all night and I couldn't hardly do it because I was going to talk last week, but I'm like, I couldn't do it. But that was his strength. 
That was his power. That's where his power came from. So Jesus was emotional. He needed to rebuild his spirit by getting away with the Father. And I believe that's the desire. If you want to look at it as a big picture, that's the desire that Jesus had. Not just to gather with his disciples or apostles, to share a meal, to share a Sabbath, I mean a, a, a Passover. He knew what was coming. And he knew he was doing it for all of us. And he knew he was doing it for all of those who came before him. So he felt that. So we have the opportunity this morning to join in and, and hopefully we can feel that too. I felt him there with us this morning in the song and praise. And as we sing praise, he joins us. Amen. And wherever we're gathered together, Amen. he's there with us. Amen. And so communion, if you look at it, he set together emblems. And that's what the Passover was. It was an emblem. It was a feast. It said um, that it was a remembrance. And Jesus says about the Lord's Supper, about this table at which you're about to take of, he says, as often as you get together to do this, do it in remembrance of me. And so that's what after the Lord is. And uh, let me read one comment here about what the Jewish traditions that were put in place, and they were kind of a, a little different in Jesus' day than what the original was. But literally, Jesus rolled with it. You know what I mean? He made it work to help people of that time to understand Amen. what it was and what he really was. In Luke 22, 7, it says, It's not surprising to see numerous references to references to the Pesach, called E-S-A-C-H, which is Passover in the New Testament. Pesach is mentioned in the Gospels, um, as well as the Book of Acts, and by far is the most well-known account is the last Pesach. Uh, is celebrated by Yeshua and his Jewish disciples in the upper room. In these accounts, one sees the traditions of the first century with added spiritual lessons taught by the Lord. <coughs> Among the traditional items mentioned are the lamb, bitter herbs, the washings, four cups of wine, and four cups of wine, and the matzah. Matzo was bread, unleavened bread. He had to be a pure leaven. There was no leavening within him. Had to be removed from their house. I don't know, seven days before that they had to go through their house and remove all leaven from their house before. That was the preparation. That was the preparing for the Passover. The lamb reminds us of the means of, of the means of redemption, the blood of the sacrifice. In this case, the Messiah became our Passover our land. The bitter herbs speak of a terrible bondage to an oppressor. Not surprisingly, it was the bowl of bitter herbs that Judas, a man who came to be a bitter end, who came to a bitter end, dipped his matzah with the Messiah. The hand and the foot washings represent the need for cleansing before approaching the Holy God. And so before we partake of the supper here today, or the Lord's Supper we call it, search your heart. And know, or am I doing this in the right way? It says that within the Gospels. Is that if we search our heart and know, are we discerning the Lord's body? Are we really understanding what Jesus came here to do? And as we do that, as we prepare our heart, we literally wash our hearts from that. Each of the four cups of wine teaches an important lesson. According to the ancient rabbis, these four cups are based on the four promises given to the children of Israel in Exodus 6, 6 through 7. Therefore I say to the people of Israel, I am Adonai. I will free you from the forced labor of the Egyptians, rescue you from their oppression, and redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. I brought along with to put on the table just a representation. You don't need to eat it. But this is the wormwood. It's called <coughs> plant wormwood. I don't need to eat anyway, the word for it. I use it in my practice. What do you use wormwood for? It's a bitter herb. And it was one of the bitter herbs at the left of Passover. It's along with hyssop and some other things. And so 
Is there a herb? What do I use it for? I use it to expel worms. Bring it up closer. There you go. I use it to expel worms. Parasites. If you have a parasite or something eating away at you, that's what Jesus has done. For our emotion, he took the bitter herb and it literally releases what's eating away at us. Amen. And so I think it's a good representation of what we also see if we understand the Jewish Passover and how that foretold of what we get to enjoy today. The first cup is the cup of sanctification that appears at the start of the cedar. And how appropriate to sanctify or set apart this service as special to the Lord. And Mike says, we don't just get together on Easter and Christmas and all that. We have a Sabbath every week. And that's what Jesus was, and I'm going to read a little bit later, but Jesus was the Sabbath. He is our rest. And it can be every day of the week. But it literally was um, remembered once a week. And it became the first day of the week instead of the seventh day. Um, and we'll study those going with that. The second cup was the cup of plagues. It is a reminder that plagues fell upon Egypt and that the Pharaoh's stubbornness, because of the Pharaoh's stubbornness, therefore many innocent people died as Israel was rescued. The third cup, the cup of redemption, was designated by the Messiah, Yeshua, as a special memorial through all generations. Luke 22, 19. And if you read that, it says that. It was once a memorial cup of physical redemption for the Jews from Egypt, but for believers in Yeshua, this cup symbolizes the spiritual redemption found in the Messiah's sacrificial blood, hence his name, Yeshua. He blessed two cups. If you do a study on what was going on, that's why I like Luke's version. He first started the first cup of blessing. He says, take you all of it, pass them on you. He blessed one cup first. Then after supper, he blessed another cup. And that was the third cup of redemption. And that's the one he says, do this in remembrance of me. Continually, perpetually. Until I return again, until I can you know, partake with the, um, you know, until we can be together again, is basically what he's saying. Now it's around the fourth cup, the cup of praise, or that some call it, or it's the halil, or the praise, which is Psalms 113 to 118. And before they left to go out to the Garden of Gethsemane, they sang the Halil, or they sang from the Psalms. Um, and that was the ending of the Passover service, or the cedar that they do. So the end of the cedar, the way all Jews do, is saying praise to God. Now we're not going to have four cups today. In fact, we barely have enough for everybody. <laughs> but hopefully we do. I, I'm pretty sure I've counted and made a head count. I think we've got like 65 cups here and I think we've got 63 people here that might have paid. So um, if it looks like we're running out, share in. It's an even a more intimate communion in that way. So uh, share with one another. So before we come, who would the, um, I pick someone to serve? Mike, could you help to serve? We'll, we'll deliver the, the bread. And what I'd like to do is pass the bread among all of us and each take the bread. We'll have a prayer of blessing for it. And then we'll all partake at the same time. I like doing it that way because it becomes even more and more feeling of all together. So let's gather together and pray. Pardon? Yeah, that'd be good. Let's say a prayer first. Our God, our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for the opportunity that we have to gather around this table praise you, to worship you, to understand that you are our salvation and all we have to do is to cry out to you and to come to you and to you. We're thankful for the memory that you have given to us through this emblem, through the service that we have today. We can remember even more closely and intimately what you suffered, what you did for us in the bringing of your son into Jesus' sacrifice. Bless now this bread, which represents his broken body, that was broken for all of us and for all of the world. So we sing and pray again.
Luke 22, 19, he says, Also taking a piece of the matzo, he made the bracha, and he broke it. The bracha means left him. And he gave it to them and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in memory of me. <coughs> And now upon the third cup of the four cups, he is also blessed. He said, and he did the same with the cup after the meal, saying, This cup is the new covenant ratified in my blood, which is being poured out for you. Jesus did not abolish the old law. He completed it. He fulfilled it. And there's a lot of writings within the Jewish Bible here that talks about how anti-Semitic, in other words, anti-Jewish, how... Some, mis some misinterpretations of the Bible itself led people to say these Jews were bad people, they killed Christ. And so therefore we got to like, they're bad people. That's not what this is about. Jews were the Jew. Yeah, they accom he accomplished what he had to do and even he says that of Judas. He says, but look, the person who is betraying me is here at the table with me. The Son of Man is going to his death according to God's plan. Lord of the man by whom he was being betrayed. In other words, he knew he had to go through that. He knew the emotion of losing a friend because the friend was appointed to do that for him. Right. So it seems like an oxymoron, like we said the other day. It seems backwards that the, um, it becomes a sanctification for us all. So the, the final cup that he just has us to remember is this cup that we'll share today. Let's have a prayer and we can again once again we'll hand it out to everybody and we'll also take it at the same time. Our God and our Father in heaven, we can thank you. And we ask that your blessing be upon this cup, the fruit of the vine, which represents the ratified new covenant, the shedding of blood, the final shedding of blood for all of mankind. To cover the sins of the world from before Jesus and even after. We're so thankful for what you have done for us as a human that you even thought of us. You want us to be a part of your creation and your plan. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
physical sensation that we just shared together brings us together closer in the communion. Although it's all personal to each one of us, what it tastes like, what it feels like, it is personal for each one of us that we all share it together. And the same in our I feel we should sing a song of Halil, and as we sang it already, Hallelujah or Hallelujah. So, shall we sing out? It's even good a cappella. Hallelujah. Sing out. Hallelujah. said that afterwards, in Luke chapter 4, uh, verse 14, we'll look at that, Luke chapter 4, verse 14, it says, Yeshua returned to Galilee from that temptation, or from the time in the wilderness, in the power of the Spirit. And so the, the Spirit was upon him, he received a bigger, bigger blessing of Spirit to accomplish his task, that was to be and what we just celebrated here now. Reports of him spread throughout the countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone respected him. Now when he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, on the Sabbath, or on the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue, as was usual, and he stood up to read. Well, really, if you understand the Jewish tradition, it was given to one person a place of honor. At the end of a Sabbath service, service to do a reading. And it was a reading of one of the prophets. And so that honor was given to Jesus in his own town. And so when he went there, and when he picked up, he stood up to read, and he was given the scroll of the prophet Yeshuyahu, which is Isaiah. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of Adonai, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord, is upon me. Therefore he has anointed me to announce good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the imprisoned and renewed sight for the blind, to release those who have been crushed, to proclaim the year of the favor of Adonai. He read from the book of Isaiah, and they say that Isaiah is the Messianic prophet in other words, just about everything that Isaiah talked about spoke of Jesus to come. Amen. Hundreds and hundreds of years before he came. They didn't, Isaiah didn't always understand what he was writing, but now we understand it. And it, it all has come to pass in our day. And after closing the scroll, verse 20, he says, and returning him to the Shamash, which was um, uh, the priest there that 
He said, or he sat down, and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. And one of the things that was given as an honor, not only did they have the opportunity to get up and read the passage of Scripture, but they were also allowed to give a little commentary. So Jesus did that. They allowed him to give a commentary. And he started to speak to them, verse 21, and he said, Today, as you heard it read, this passage of the Tanaka was fulfilled. They didn't really understand that, but everyone was speaking well of him and marveling that such appealing words were coming from his mouth. They were even asking, Can this be Joseph's son? Then Yeshua said to them, No doubt you will quote to me the proverb. In other words, you guys probably think I'm crazy. Is what he was meaning by this statement. He said, Physician, heal yourself. And I truly say that Jesus was the physician that healed himself to get him through all of this, but also as our representative for us as well and as our physician. There's no doubt you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. We've heard all about these things, we've heard all, all of these things, and that they have been going on over in, in um, the other part of the land. Now, now we do them here in your hometown. In other words, you've done these miracles in other places. Now do them here in your hometown is what Jesus is saying. And he says, but this is what I'm telling you. He goes, yes, I tell you that no prophet is accepted in his hometown. It's true, I'm telling you. When Elijah was in Israel and the sky was sealed off for three and a half years so that the land suffered a severe famine, there were many widows. But Elijah was sent to none of them, only to a widow in Zarephath in the land of Sidon. That's the land of the Gentiles. He wasn't given to the house of Israel. That's the interpretation. They're, they're starting to kind of like, what's he talking about? And now also there were people in, in uh, there were many people there with uh, leprosy in Israel during the time of the prophet Elisha. But not one of them was healed, only Naaman the Syrian. Remember, he told him to go dip in the Jordan River. And he was cleansed. On hearing this, everyone in the synagogue was filled with fury. They rose up, drove him out of town, and dragged him to the edge of a cliff on which their town was built, intending to throw him off. So his ministry began right away with a little turmoil. He brought a message that not everybody wanted to hear, especially the Jews. He's like, what are you talking about? You're going to go talk to these unheathen, unbelieving, non-Jewish people. You can't do that. These, the Jews had a very harsh thing against the Samaritans or the Syrians and like those groups of people. They were like, they're not God's chosen people. They can go away as far as they were concerned. It's like they felt they were special people. But Jesus says, and he's telling them, them then at the beginning of his ministry that he is for all not just we are all became that Abraham's seed and God's chosen people and so they rose up to drive him out of town and throw him off the cliff but when he but he walked right through the middle of the crowd and went away a lot of speculation goes with that statement what was he did he do a miracle did he just like disappear like one of the magicians or, or was he like Yoda and just said you will stop. <laughs> he will not throw me from the cliff. <laughs> so in other words, and he just turned around and literally his presence. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane when they came to arrest him? His very presence knocked him flat. He was full of the Spirit now. And it was not his time. He had the ability to do that. He just said, no, not now. And he turned around and just walked back through the crowd and, just, and went on with his mission. So I think that's some of the greatness and the power. I'd like to look a little bit more back to um, what I started with. With great earnest desire, I have desired, from Luke chapter 22. And so we've already read that reading about that and what that meant. Jesus was an emotional being just as we are. And the gospel writers paint their portraits of Jesus using a kaleidoscope of brilliant emotional colors. Jesus felt compassion. He was angry, indignant, 
consumed with zeal. He was troubled, greatly distressed, very sorrowful, depressed, deeply moved, grieved. And he sighed, he wept, he sobbed, he groaned, he was in agony, he was surprised, he was amazed, he rejoiced very greatly, and he was full of joy, and he greatly desired, and most of all he loved. So Paul tells us in the, uh, the Corinthian letter, 2 Corinthians 3.18, we can find that quickly here, Duncan. But Paul is suggesting that as we look intently on our Lord, and then how the fact that he was an emotional being, that we too are an emotional being, we're also looking at when Jesus was here, not only seeing Jesus on the earth, but what does Jesus represent? He represents the Father. I didn't do anything except for the Father gave it to me. So you mean God's emotional? Yeah, He is. God is just emotional. He is emotional. He's got anger. He's got love. He's got passion. He wants people to understand what this creation is all about. So we see God through Jesus. So Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 3.18 um, he illustrates this kind of transformation in our life. Um, he says, I long for you with the compassion of Christ. Um, well, I said that in Philippians 1, 18. Let me read where I wrote it. Oh, but the Lord, that we are with unveiled faces, we are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. So the question is, what is God really like? Is answered during the exchange between Jesus and the disciple Philip. Remember when Philip says, show us the Father. And he goes, Philip, have I not been with you long enough that you don't see that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? And so he was the, the actual representation. And so it gives us an understanding that not only was Jesus emotional, but God is so is. If we are of the body of Christ created and redeemed to represent Jesus in our world, and we, like Paul, need to gaze upon him and to learn to experience the emotions of Jesus, then we can know him, and in knowing him, know God, and to know ourselves as we were created to be. A lot of what I do in my treatment is, is emotional work. And many times it, it stems from we're going through a stressful situation, something almost overwhelming, just as we saw Jesus, was overwhelmed with his time of passion of coming to his own crucifixion coming. So, when you're in a stressful situation, literally our conscious brain tends to go into survival mode. We shut down. And so in the process of shutting down, we don't function to our full capacity of our unconscious or our subconscious that controls and regulates every function within our body. And I believe that it, that control and function it comes from spirit. And it comes to us through not only our spirit, but God's Spirit living within us. And so we, so we say excommunicate, we cut off ourselves from Spirit when we go into an overwhelming negative or emotion that is not supportive for us. We're going to survival. So what I'm saying is Jesus did the same thing. So when we go into an emotion, if we can step back, if we can literally take time as Jesus did and get away, you know, whether it's driving down the road or whether it's sitting in a classroom or whether it's at work, you, um, an emotion pops in your head that's seemingly out of nowhere. What would Jesus do with that emotion? What did he do with that emotion? And we see that that's what Jesus was. He was our high priest. And in, in Hebrews 4, it talks about that. <clears throat> I'm kind of getting ahead of myself and I'm just bringing it out as it comes to me. But that... He was tempted or he understood every human emotion just like we are. So therefore, if he had to go through it, we know we can go through it as well. And he will give us an answer. What I'm saying is get by yourself. Not by yourself, but with God. Get with, get with Yeshua. Get an understanding of what is this and how can I see it better. 
So instead of being stuck in the negative aspect of that emotion, I don't see any emotion as being negative, but rather it brings us to the positive. The negative becomes turned into what is the healing that we are to receive. One of the first things I want to talk about about Jesus and his emotion was compassion. One of my favorite verses is in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. When it says, For whom did Jesus feel compassion? For, in need, for those people that were in need. When he saw a need, compassion meant, passion meaning a desire, a strong desire again, but calm is next to, with that compassion, you link them together and it causes you to act, it causes you to do something for those people that need their, your compassion. So he felt it for a leper in Mark 1, 40 and 41. A widow by the coffin of her only son, remember that they had died, in Luke 7, 13. Two blind men, Matthew 20, 34. He also felt compassion when he saw the starving crowds. Uh, he gave him bread, remember the bread and loaves, or the loaves and fishes, rather. His compassion was stirred by physical and spiritual needs. His heart broke when he saw people who were distressed and downcast, like sheep without a shepherd. And that's what Matthew 9 talks about. Matthew 9, 36. It's like he looked at the crowd. He had just come from being alone and needing an escape or a getaway. And they came to him, looking for him. They disturbed him on the mountain and said, you got people here, the disciples said. They need your help. So Jesus left his alone time to be with the people again. And he said he saw them, that they were to and fro. The sheep were scattered. They didn't know where to go. They needed a leader. And so with compassion, he became the leader. Jesus' empathy flowed out from his intimacy with the Father. It was after a time of withdrawal and lonely place that by himself for prayer that Jesus saw a leper. And he felt compassion for him, Mark 1. 35 through 45. <laughs> now, in times of alone with God, Jesus gained emotional receptivity and energy. Out of these times, his vision was clear, his words were empowered, and his touch cured. He created bread, he restored sight to the blind, he cleansed the leper, he raised the widow's dead son, and his compassion was translated from feelings of, into actions. His empathy was the effective power behind him. Now let's look at anger. Did Jesus get angry? <clears throat> and I think the, the best one of anger is not only when he saw in the temple how they were making a marketplace out of the temple rather than a place of worship or a house of prayer. And um, he actually took time to fashion a whip to accomplish his task. So it was a planned thing that he was doing. He didn't just go into a rage and like, what is going on here? No, he saw what was going on. He knew what he wanted to accomplish. He fashioned a whip to goad these animals out of the, out of the temple. And so um, he was very constructive and direct to his anger. But early on in his ministry, uh, Jesus heals on the Sabbath. And he was at the synagogue, he was on the Sabbath, and he asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? But they were silent, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Um, they looked around, or they, Jesus looked around with them, and with anger, and with sorrow at the hardness of their heart. And then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and it was restored. And at this point, then the Pharisees went out to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. So even by doing good, he was not only angry or frustrated with them, but he, was, he just was amazed at their hardness of heart. It, it, it saddened them to think that they could see the truth, but yet they didn't want to bend to it. They didn't want to... That's a whole other level of betrayal and um, rejection. You know. He was the savior of the world, and they couldn't see it. Aristotle said this, Anyone can become angry. That's easy. But to be angry with the right person, to the right degree, at the right time, for the right purpose, and in the right way, well, that's not easy. So that's what Jesus did. 
That's the challenge that is, that is before us. Another one was Jesus felt indignant. And this emotion was like, come on guys, get with the program here. Jesus felt indignant. Mark chapter 10, verse 14, and when his disciples did not allow the mothers to bring their children to him for his blessing, the disciples' self-importance irritated Jesus. Jesus stopped or slapped them with a stinging rebuke. He says, let the children come to me. Stop preventing them. Jesus then hugged the children, blessed them, and laid his hands on them. Jesus' feeling of annoyance with the disciples quickly gave way to an outpouring of warm affection for the children. So, see it for what it is, and that must be good, anyway. So, very much so. Anger is often sparked by a threat to your own self-interest, and usually results in bitter hostility. You need to heed Paul's warning, be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down upon your anger. We give no opportunity to the devil. The temple cleansing story is even is too often to justify an inactivity or an unforgiving animosity. And that's not what it was about. Paul knew our, propens- our, um, our opportunity really to legitimize our self-centeredness. And so his words on anger are full of warning. Now let's look at grief. A man of sorrows. Isaiah 53, if we read that, we see the man of sorrows and what he was. Let's also read, um, let's remember Luke's uh, version of the triumphant entry. Let's look at uh, Luke 19 and 41. Uh, right there, Luke 19, starting in verse 41. Remember, he was up on the Mount of Olives, and <clears throat> what was there that he came to, to town on in his triumphant entry? In the Roman days, um, there was a man on huge, you know, in a chariot, there's a king that was coming to, to town, and you know, he had big white horses, and he was a huge following all behind him, just, you know, singing praises about this king that's coming to town. Okay, that was the Roman version of the triumphant entry. But what did Jesus come in? He came in on a colt, never ridden before, from a donkey. The baby of a donkey, or a colt, that was actually never ridden before. The humble entry. But when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city, and he wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have hidden it from your eyes, for the days will come upon you, and your enemies will throw up a barricade against you, and surround you, and hem you in on every side, and they will level you to the ground, and, to, and your children within you. And they will not leave you, leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. So Jesus, when he was coming into the city, he knew what was going to happen to Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you know, you daughters, that I would, like chicken gathering or hen gathering her chicks, I would have you come to me. But they didn't understand it. Jesus also wept at the tomb of Lazarus. Witnesses said, see how he loved him. In John 11, 36, when Jesus saw Mary weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. When he stepped near the tomb of his friend, again he was greatly disturbed, is what the reading says. In verse 38 of of John, of John 11. When the word disturbed was used, it was actually used for more like animal sounds. It denoted a loud, angry snorting of horses. So you, you think of Jesus doing that? I remember one time, there was a family, um, they moved in the church where we was at, and they moved to Chicago. And they hadn't been there for about six months. It was a great it was a great family. They were always supportive. They were always in service. They were always helping people. And um, their young son was in football. He was old enough to start football. I think he was like 15, 16 years old. And they went to a football gathering for the whole team afterwards. And some other kids came by and shot into the house. He was hit and killed, this young man. And um, in other words, 
stories of only the good by young, so to speak. But I remember to this day, not what was said at the funeral, but the dad at the end of the funeral, he just wailed. He wept for his son. That's what Jesus did. He had that emotion that he was disturbed to the point that it caused him to, to moan. It wasn't moaning because Lazarus was dead and he wasn't going to bring him back. He felt the hurt of all the other people not understanding and knowing what death really was. They didn't know what death was. He's like, they're gone. He's gone forever. And that's what Jesus came to do. He came to teach different things. And so it was likewise that way that his moaning and his groaning was seen by others, that he was a very real person. The Gospels portray Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane as one who is crushed by a heavy load of grief. He did not shrink from disclosing his deepest and darkest emotions to his disciples. He said that to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. He said it was so heavy for him that he just, it nearly killed him just being there and understanding what was coming. He begged for them to stay awake and to keep him company, but they slept because of sorrow. His emotions were too heavy for them to bear. They escaped into sleep, leaving Jesus alone. Terrible, or terror-stricken and in terrible anguish. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mark 14, 33 talks about that. Jesus agonized over the awful choice to either endure or to even escape the cross. Don't think he didn't think about it. Um, that, can I do this? Can I really accomplish this? But he was strengthened in spirit by his Father. And as he wrestled in prayer, he was drenched by his own sweat, which ran like blood to the ground. Jesus' familiarity with grief should give us a pause. Too often we hear the Americanized version of the gospel that offer quick fixes or easy solutions for suffering free discipleship. Like we don't have to suffer. But in this life we do. We have trouble. But we know that Jesus overcame the trouble for us. We need a reminder that the man who knew God most intimately and, fu and fulfilled his will most completely was described in Isaiah as the suffering servant. Surely he has borne our grief and he has carried our sorrow. <clears throat> Let's read Isaiah 53. And I think it's a fitting coming to a closure of what I'm trying to talk about, about what Jesus was. And I of what I believe the most important emotions that Jesus carried. Isaiah 53. If we can find it. We'll start reading. He said, so in verse 1, Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. He has um, no form of majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, and man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. I think verse 4 gives the best rendition of what I believe the most important emotion Jesus had. For all of mankind. He was empathetic. It's not that he didn't feel what was going on. When he came to Jerusalem, he saw the tragedy that was coming. He felt it. Iris, my wife, talks about this. The difference between an empath and somebody who's just sensitive. <clears throat> And I think that best describes you, if you understand this the best, is that a sensitive person can feel somebody and can maybe even react and, and help them with compassion. <clears throat> they can understand their hurts, but they can withdraw from it. An empath can't. They feel it. They don't know where it comes from. They're like, what's this all about? Oh, somebody else now, I found out two days later, were having the same emotion. And they were thinking of me and whether I could help them. That's an empath. And it's hard for somebody. There's empaths in this room. And I think you know who you are. You take on other people's feelings and not even realize you're doing it. That was Jesus. 
He did that for us. He could feel it. He still feels us now. He looks at our heart. He looks at our mind. He looks at our thoughts. He looks at what are we really feeling on the inside. He still empathizes with us. But he was pierced for our transgressions. It's like we did it to him. So therefore, that was the hurt that I believe Jesus was coming to the cross with. So whether, can I do this or not? Can I take on all of humanity and doing what I'm doing here? <clears throat> That's a little heavy, so let's change a little bit. Joy. Jesus also felt joy. While Jesus was a man of sorrows, Luke also paints a scene. It's a very good one. Where Jesus rejoiced very greatly in the spirit, which implies more than a cracking a white wry smile. The occasion for this outburst was the return of the 70 from their successful mission. They had been given spiritual authority over the powers of the enemy like a crack SWAT team had liberated hostages. There was good reason to celebrate. He sent them out on a mission to do some things, and he came, they came back and he said, well, what did you find? And he said, even the snakes and even the, the sickness, and nothing could harm us. You know, we changed people's lives, is what they said. But Jesus cautions them. He kind of tenors it a little bit, and he says this, Do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. In other words, you've got a place in this whole scheme of things. And he says, no matter how much power they exercise in their ministry, the ultimate source of their joy was to be rooted in their heavenly community. Their names were written in heaven forever. Ministry is temporary, but life in the divine community is permanent. Then Jesus joyfully thanked the Father for opening the hearts of the disciples to see this and to enter into the fellowship of the Father and of the Son. So, Jesus went into praise to God. And I, I'm thankful that you showed it to, and he says, uh, these ordinary people, or that these people of simpleness, they can understand this rather than trying to give it to somebody who would ruin the power and um, take it for their own gain. So Jesus felt joy. And the other thing was most important, and again, is love. When a wealthy young man ran up to Jesus, he knelt before him and asked, how could he inherit eternal life? Jesus looked at him and he loved him. And as soon as he saw him, his affection welled up for him in his heart. Just as sometimes when you meet someone, you get a, a strong feeling or a need that that person might need. You can have compassion for them. You don't know why sometimes, but just like Mike said, you share a smile with them. You just give them a word of encouragement. So love permeated and guided and empowered the spectrum of Jesus' emotions. He felt compassion, was angry, grieved, rejoiced because he loved. Love is an unshakable commitment of the will. Love transcends feelings and keeps us ongoing when feelings falter and vanish. But love also involves and expresses their emotions. So Jesus loved with a strong desire. He told his you know, the disciples at that time, with, I have desired with great desire to eat this Passover with you before I, I suffer. <clears throat> finish or get through what I want to accomplish today and take a little bit not going too long. And I'd like to read Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2 starting in verse 9. But we see but we do see Yeshua who indeed was made a little lower a little while lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that God's, by God's grace he might taste death for all humanity. For in bringing many sons to glory, it was only fitting that God, the creator and preserver of everything, should bring the initiator of their deliverance to the goal through sufferings. For both Yeshua who sets people apart for God, or who sets people apart for God, and the ones being set apart have a common origin. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. When he says, I will proclaim your name to my brothers, in the midst of the congregation I will sing your praise. Also, I will put my trust in him. And then it goes on, here I am, 
along with the children God has given you. Therefore, since the children share a common physical nature as human beings, he became like them and shared that same human nature, so that by his death he might render ineffective the one who had the power over death, that is, the adversary, and thus set free those who had been in bondage all their lives because of their fear of death. Indeed, it is obvious that he does not take hold of angels to help them. On the contrary, he takes hold of the seed of Abraham. This is why he had to become like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, making a, an atonement, the, the Hebrew word is kaparach, which means make an atonement, a propitiation, an intercession, or specifically pardon or forgiveness for the sins of the people. For since he himself suffered death when he was put to the test, he is able to help those who are being tested now. To me, that's the big picture. To me, that's the desire of Jesus when he came to that last supper before he was suffered. That was what he was, I believe, feeling. If I can give it my commentary. I'm, not, I'm kind of a commentary, so... Um, anyway... <laughs> but that's what I believe it was is that Jesus was able to understand and feel us today and he knew by what he was going through we would look back and see it and it would actually help us to continue on to shed and to bring his glory so from the beginning of Jesus' ministry he realized that he would be rejected and that his the statement of the parable position here myself was essentially true and it's true for us today Heal ourselves from our emotions. To be able to maintain his sanity, resolve the commitment to his purpose, it required an intimate communion with the Father. In 2 Corinthians 3, 17, he instituted the new covenant. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into his image, with intensifying glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. I thank you for your kind attention. And I hope we blessed you today. I know I have been blessed immensely by being here with you. I turn it over to you. I like that play on words. Dr. Terry said he was a common Terry. <laughs> Amen. Uh, pass your little uh, cups down to the end of the row, and Mike, if you pick them up, just let them stack up. And uh, uh, Blake, would you come up here and pick them up on this end? Mike, just get these on this side. I have Blake with that side. Just pass them down, okay? Uh, Duncan, put our song up there, Well I Look for God. I think it's Well I Look, maybe it's I Look. That's all the same. You can just throw them on the track. So you know, <coughs> when He's the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Amen? Praise the Lord. I just... Uh, it's Easter all the time around here, recognizing His Lordship and uh, realizing that the resurrection changed something for the whole world. The Bible says that the, the, it got dark and the, the rocks broke in two and the earth quaked. And it, it affected the, the whole universe. How could one man hang on a wooden beam do that. It's it's a mystery to the to people who don't have an ear for the spirit. But when you have an ear to the, for the spirit, you know what the spirit's saying. His resurrection did something that no other guru ever did. Muhammad, Buddha, none of that has affected the world like Jesus. 
And uh, so uh, since he's arose from the dead, I, I tell you what, I, I want to jump up here to help you so much today. You just tr intrigued me with some new thoughts and things. I appreciate that. Anyway, once, once we don't know Jesus on the inside, the song says, I look for God where? Everywhere. And I couldn't find him. Anywhere. So I looked inside and found him there. Now I see God where? Everywhere. Everywhere. That's what God does. He changes us. It's not good boys or bad boys anymore. We just see the potential of God in everybody. Let's sing it. Well, I look for God. and the fullness thereof. Now there's a lot of people in it that's made it wicked, but that's not God. The world is the Lord's. You know what? I believe He'll change it. I just believe there's enough scripture in the Bible tells us He'll change it. And I'm willing to believe that. Amen. 
Bill, come make some announcements. We'll let these people that own the Easter dinner with their family. <laughs> Well, we're here to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord, right? Amen. But as I look over the congregation, about 63 people, more or less, every time, according to this song, every time you get up in the morning, there's a resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ because it's inside of you. Amen. And he is seen everywhere. Well, next Sunday after the service, Audie is going to fry some fish, and we're going to have a fish dinner here. Bill, hold on, they changed that. It's now the last Sunday. Well, you went here last Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> See what happens when you go away? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to be a good time. Yeah, it's going to be a good time. So the last Sunday, bring a dish prepared for the fish, for you to eat the fish. Okay, uh, a week from this coming Friday night is the gathering got to be here for that and then on what is it May the uh, May the 6th the ladies are going to be here okay now the pastor and the commentary talked about Easter and Christmas of people attending those two particular days there are people that only attend those days this minister where he was talking to a gentleman that attended his church once in a while and he said, are you in the army of the Lord? Oh, yes. Well, if you're army in the Lord, why do you only attend on Christmas and Easter? He said, I'm in the secret service. <laughs> Leave it to me. <laughs> Amen. Well, remember the, the, the uh, gathering we're having. Gaddy and that kind of stuff? Yes. Am I right on that, <laughs> So bring a dish for that, okay? And uh, bring a, a dish that go along with, with fish for Audi for the last Friday night. It'll be the Sunday last, after the yes, Friday night. Thank you. Sunday after the gathering, okay. The reason why we change it is this. We got some folks coming from out of town for the gathering that's going to stay over for Sunday. And that will give us time for fellowship with them too, okay? I think these pretty girls got something to share today. <laughs> we need all the teens to be here for the gathering um, on the 28th. Um, and also we're going to be serving the adults. Um, we're going to be taking the teens to Branson for the Winter Extreme Conference in December, and we're going to do our first fundraiser after the gathering. Okay, what this means is this is going to cost about $7,000 to take a bunch of teens and some uh, adults along too uh, for, the get, for the Winter Extreme. And uh, what they're going to do, they're going to, you're going to get in line for the gathering after the, for the meal afterwards. But the girl's going to serve, serve you, and the boys is going to make sure you have your drinks and all that stuff. Leave them a tip or an offering, and that little offering goes towards their fundraiser. Okay? So, uh, and if you don't have a cent, you come and enjoy Italian dinner after the gathering. We're going to have a good time. How many were, how many were here for the gathering last, last month? All right. If you weren't here, you missed a tremendous service. We never know what's going to happen next. Just some good things happening. We, we about sung plenty in the Monday last time. So, <laughs> God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful week this week. See you next Sunday.